Thank you very much for doing this, Luciano. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's a real pleasure for me. Um, we've been talking for a little bit, and uh, finally we've been able to do this. And yeah. uh, I felt like now was a, a really good time to talk to you a little bit about your past, because people, I think, they just they think they know um, your background, but you've got quite a, a colorful one. So um, let's start right at the beginning about your studying and how you became a car designer. Yeah. When, I, when I was uh, about 19 years old, I, was, I used to check those uh, car magazines in Italy. You know, I was addicted to it. So every Sunday, it was the moment to go with my father, sometimes walk in the little village and then enter in the in the shop and buy those magazines and one time on gente motori which is still today like quattro ruote gente motori you know all those big important magazines uh, there was a beautiful reportage on art center college of design and i still remember that the, the journalist was lino magnocchia and uh, lino magnocchia was from uh, uh, italian in new york and he would always make those sort of reportage uh, with design schools, uh, the Italian design, the Italians, what they do and stuff. And he discovered this school. So he made a beautiful reportage, four pages, full colors, with students working on their clay models, uh, full scale, with aerograph, you know. When I saw that, I said, I need this. That's what I want to be. So basically what happens is that I show this to my parents and the big debate started in the house because I was studying economy to enter into my father's business. Which was ah, were you, you were already studying at this time or? Yeah, yeah. Because 19 years old, you already have one year of university. Okay. Okay. So I was doing economy because my father was a, uh, a very important uh, in Italy at that time, very important, uh, how do you say, um, a fiscal expert. Wow. And he was making laws for the, gov the government. Jesus, wow. So sometimes I would drive in the Lancia Gamma made by Fini Farina with him to Rome, and I would be inside and reading the paper, and he would work the whole day. And I was just sitting there watching him discussing, debating with the syndicate, the unions, the, the employees, the problems, the government calling. In he was writing, making a laws, proposals. And uh, he was making, he was president of uh, MPAC. MPAC. MPAC, it's what uh, it's called today, uh, social security. Yeah for retirement, so all the fixer, fixer experts in Italy, which are independent. So it's a private social security, not public. So you were, were you allowed to sit in on those conversations and listen? No, conversation, no. I was just oh. sitting uh, on, the, on the couch that was in this beautiful, beautiful building, uh, beautiful office, which was uh, the president's office. And then uh, after lunch, uh, around 5 p.m., 6 p.m., we would, from Rome, we would drive back to my little town, so 250 kilometers. Wow. And then he had his own business with 16 uh, employees doing that for all the big uh, companies in, in my region. So how did those conversations with him go uh, uh, about you wanting to not follow through in the family yeah, the business? And is, at the beginning, he said, no, please, we already discussed about this. Uh, this is a nice hobby. I, I like the fact that you draw, that you paint, that you like cars. I like cars too. But economy is the, the reality. My business is going to be yours because you understand you are the only male in the family, you know, your sisters are doing other things. Yeah. And then I have to say that my mother, today my parents are not there anymore, um, sadly. But um, it was my mother that 
that one night he told him very clearly, said, look, you are doing all you are doing is for passion. You are building everything you are doing from nothing. Nobody gave you anything. It's just your passion, your dedication, your uh, seriousity, the, the way you are serious in working. You work a lot. You work on weekends. Now, your son has a similar passion in something different. I think the minimum thing you could do, and we could do as parents, is to let him try. And wow. Him in something. So little by little, one day, my father, after a month of that, he came and said, uh, you know what, I think that would be a very good thing if you learn how to speak English. <laughs> because in English, I had really super low, but super low grades. And I would pass with the minimum because the lady that was teaching English in the village was an ex uh, colleague student of my father when they were young. And my father spoke English because uh, he, he went, during the war, the Second World War, he was a prisoner by the British and he would translate uh, for the Italians the letter of love <laughs> for the English ladies what? in English. And he would get paid for that during this, uh, how do you call, uh, when he was prisoner. Jesus. Because they, were, they could uh, go to the exterior, you know, sometimes. Wow. So he was in the, in, in the office, even if he was prisoner. So mama so talked said, some you know, sense into him, huh? Huh? So mama talked sense into him. Yeah. Yeah. My mother did, uh, how can I say, the dirty job. <laughs> And little by little, he started understanding that he could not force me wow. to do something that for me was... Com it was com it's very complicated to take the job and the place of a man that is your father yeah. when you know that he reached the highest point from starting from nothing. After yeah. He worked until he was 75 years old. Wow. So you can imagine a man that was a great manager... A visionary, some of his uh, friends when he was young, they were saying, Emilio is fantastic, but he's a crazy man. Because he was doing things for the village, for the town, that were completely out of place. He was the first one in his category in the 50 to buy a car, <laughs> brand new car. Oh, really? Yeah, which was a Fiat 600. Oh, wow. <laughs> And then a lunch up, yeah. <laughs> so you can understand, I, I had a great, the truth is that I had a great example. From my mother, more romantic, and my father, more business, you know, pragmatic. We're going to build this, then we're going to do that, and that. And he built a lot of stuff. So focus and drive. Yeah. And when I was uh, uh, reading the paper while he, we were in Rome, during those meetings with important people, in reality, I was learning management. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You were able to witness him um, conducting these meetings. Yeah, negotiation. Yes, yeah. yeah, this is, I mean, this is, this is invaluable. In fact, uh, today I'm a manager since I, I started in Fiat, but uh, today in Renault, I am a manager that applies a lot of his methodology. Wow. Also because I'm very similar in a way, you know, very similar. But I have that romantic part and creative part that comes from my mother. So I'm a mix, you know. <laughs> so Luciano, then you so you see, so eventually the conversation turns and you decide, um, you, but you decide that you want to go to Art Center. That's the place to go to. No, this came after because my father, you have to know, because of that job, the presidency at this uh, important uh, social security for uh, fiscal people in Italy, he had a lot of uh, uh, contacts with the minister of, uh, of the work in Italy, a labor minister, but also with the president of the small companies all over Italy. At that time, the president was uh, Sergio Pinifarina, no. Andrea. Yeah. Wow. And one time he went there and they were in the parliament, you know, so they met. And my father said, I have to ask you, I am in a big crisis. I have to ask you a question, a favor, like a father, not for job. 
And he said, yeah, if I can help you, why not? And please tell me that time they were very respectful, you know, not like today that we are, you know, saying you, you, but it was more like yeah. the name, you know, yes. like the distance and the respect. And, and, and picking fun, I said, what's the problem? That my son, he, he's drawing all the time. He, I even gave him a small place only for him in my office, my personal office, because we have some rooms and therefore one small room is only for him. One time I entered and there were cars sketching, I mean, stuff all over. He sends his drawings to Gente Motori. I saw that they published one of his drawings, which is this one. And this is my father gave it to me for Christmas, you know? Oh, wow. And uh, he's 19 years old. What the hell do I have to do? I don't know if he has the talent. I don't know if, if this is all crazy or if he's right. I, I, I don't know. And could you please check his drawings? Someone from Ping Farin. And he said, that's no problem. We're going to organize this. Ask him to put all his drawings together. Send him to Torino. And then I will tell you as a father, if I would send this guy to the right school. And that's what happened. Because my father was uh, the, pre the national president of all the fiscal, pe uh, fiscal you know, people and involved in social security, he called his colleague in, in Torino and he said, yeah, Emilio, don't worry, send me here. I will take the hotel. I will, I will uh, drive him to be in Farina. We already have, uh, you know, got the, the, the rendezvous, the timing, everything. So for the first time alone, I took all my drawings with a nice suit and, and, uh, and a red tie. And I went to Torino, 18 hours in the train because we didn't have uh, the high speed train at that time. I get Jesus. there. In the morning, I get to Cambiano. And when I got in there, I said I was just getting a heart attack with all those beautiful models in the entrance. Everything was made of glass. I said, what the hell am I in the future? I'm in the future. This is my home. <laughs> wow. And then there was Brovarone that passed away a few years ago. Fantastic design of Ferraris of the 70s and the 80s. Diego Ottina, also excellent designer of the best juicy time of Pininfarina. And Ramaciotti, Lorenzo Ramaciotti, that was the head of the design department, that was very, very kind to me to, to host me and then present me to those two expert designers. So they saw my drawings, they sketched with me. No, you have to buy markers. What are you doing with this uh, <laughs> stuff? You have to buy markers. You look, I show you how it worked and they made demos for me. So that, I was uh, I was completely astonished, uh, positively uh, struck by them, and and I was dreaming. But I said, who knows what they think about, uh, how they feel about me and and my drawings. And three days later, so I came back. Three days later, my father comes back home, and he says. Uh, Luciano, I have a good news for you. I already talked to your mother. I think you're going to go to U.S. for one year to an ELS college in Oakland. We already decided how to do. We already found the school. I have a friend in California, so don't worry. And then if you want, you can try to get admitted at the Art Center College of Design. Because Piggy Ferringa said uh, whether it's Royal College in London or California. And they explained to me that the difference is that the Royal College is an excellent school, a little bit traditional, but Art Center College of Design, there they're really, they are very visionary. Tell me something, Luciana, did, uh, uh, what, is it, did Sid Mead set up the curriculum for Art Center? Or is, is that... Uh, Sid Mead comes from Art Center. Ah, okay. He, so so the then... 50. Okay, so he st he actually studied at Art Center. Yeah, and then he okay. came to give a regular lecture. I met him once. In fact, there is a video on my YouTube channel uh, that is a tribute to to Sid Mead uh, that I made when I was in China two years ago when he passed away. What do you think makes somebody like that so brilliant? Like this, he he is 
I mean, the, what he was able to do with analog tools was absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. I think. Well, you have to know. You yeah. Have to know that Sid Mead's story is a very particular story. Sid Mead, already at the age of three, four years old, was holding a pencil. And he had uh, parents that always encouraged him to draw. They saw that this guy had an incredible developed natural talent for drawing. He was not obsessed with the best car design. He was always, since young age, obsessed to give a meaning to the object, to whether it was a car or a product, because he made also products. Huh? If those products and those cars were in the right visionary context. So Sid Mead is probably the first and the only, I guess, at my, at my knowledge, okay, designer, visionary futurist designer that did something. He first, he had in his mind the environment. And that's the reason why with Sid Mead, you never see just the car or just the Sony camera or the Sony TV or whatever. You see always the context in which all this can stay well, so that everything is justified. And that's why you have those beautiful renderings where you see life storytelling with these products, with this detailing, with these buildings, because he was, he, he was living a parallel life. There was one of uh, his uh, assistants that has been with his assistant for a long time that said uh, that also was assistant when he made the, 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 the sketching and the renderings for the movies. No, said uh, Sidney is par very particular because this guy is living in the 80s, but when he is uh, really living in his brain, it's uh, 2020 already. So, you talk to him in the today's context, but he's behaving and thinking 50 years ahead. Wow. And, and that's how he was. And also the, the movie directors of the movies that he made, he said, with Sid Mead is fantastic because even we don't get to some points and he says, oh, no, 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 I'll tell you, we should do like this, like that, and justifies that. There are some excellent videos on YouTube where Sid Mead is interviewed by the movie industry telling the experience they had together on the, on the, on the movies they made together. And the movie directors or assistants say, it's incredible, we didn't know how to do things. Haiti would just come and say, I don't know, but we're going to do like this or like that, it's going to work. That, I mean, the guy, he's, I've, yeah, I, I absolutely, I mean, he's a, Probably, yeah, you would call you would classify him as a genius, I think. He is a genius. He's a genius that inspired all of us. Also, when I sketch and, and think of warm and cool, the warm and cool comes from him. And he came in, he got that studying Raffaello, Leonardo da Vinci, Rembrandt, all the big painters of uh, uh, the uh, Rangis, uh, Re, uh, I don't know how to say in English Renaissance Renaissance uh, period because they were studying they were using the focal point the light the strong light the drama you know the drama in their proportions their in their in their compositions on page on on uh, on canvas and uh, Sidney took all that and amplified it with this palette, color palette, which is very particular. Those blue, those violet, the orange, the yellow creamy color, the black, the really juicy black, you know, how to enhance uh, reflections, surfaces, you know. The, 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 and then he goes, uses this all over. But the way he uses focal point, still today, it's what I try to teach to, People, the focal point is very fundamental. Look at uh, look at Sidney the uh, illustration. 
you see the focal point because your eyes go there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, once you get the core of the subject, little by little, your brain starts decoding everything else. Now, if you go on a bad uh, illustration, and unfortunately I see many, especially on Photoshop, you see flash and lights all over. Colors, warm and cool, are always the same colors. It's Lens. like a standardized, you know, standard thing. And then your eyes bounce right and back. And when you stop watching, you don't remember anymore what you were watching. But if you look at Sid Mead or someone else that replicates that type of technique, that masters the technique, you remember the subject. The subject speaks by itself. And it's all a matter of talent, and mastering that technique it's mind-blowing i mean when you that that's that's one thing that that springs to mind is is fo is the focal point when you look at his stuff yeah because it fe like you're looking at this analog picture but it's almost like somebody's put this invisible lens that like a telescope that that transports your your eye to a particular point in that in the illustration it's incredible yes. It's the first reading, the second reading, and the third reading. And when we do cars, we do the same thing. Because when we draw cars, even on a simple sketch, what is the first reading? Ah, yeah, I heard you talking about it. So, yeah, to, to go through that. Talk, to, talk about that. What is the first reading? The first reading is the proportions. I mean, is it the car with a long nose? a uh, short back, low, you know, pushing forward, uh, or has a cabin, forward cabin, therefore it's a very long back. Is it a, a consequence of a sort of an accelerated line, like Strother McMean, Mac my ex, my teacher that also, he passed away a long time ago. My art center, he was a maestro, you know. The sections, he would talk to you about lines. Not surfaces, lines. How do you draw your lines? Are we making an accelerated line? Dynamic line? What type of dynamicity you give to that line? You know, what type of direction? What is the axe of that surface that is given by two lines? And how is the section? And therefore the surface. So, you go into that detail and when you become a professional and you start doing that on models on scale one to one or you know, on digital also you go through that discipline you know step one step two step three the reading number two is the character lines because they generate your reflections and your shapes and then the reading number three are some details that don't have to be overdone because if you overdo details, or also sections, you, you risk, you know, there is a, there is a, a sort of, a, how can I say, frontier, you know. There is a point that you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to go over. Yes. And if you do, even for one millimeter, you fucked it up, basically. <laughs> so it's very hard. It's very hard. It comes with experience. It's very hard. But the tendency of everybody, also for me when I was young, was, oh, I got another idea, I'm going to edit. Oh, I got another little thing on that little day, it's going to be juicy, fantastic, like a jewelry. Then you look at the picture, it's full of stuff. And then you have to erase. <laughs> because it becomes incomprehensible. Just like an illustration, where you have too many flash lights, and then you get lost. Do you think do you think he's ever gone like um I imagine he's messed up some paintings in his life but he obviously was also so prolific he did so many and he was he he was the master right yeah. Do you think he got to the point towards um like later on in his career where he could do an illustration and he knows that he will not screw it up that everything he he just like, he doesn't need to do three, four attempts. He just nails it one time. I, I, I think that um, 
one thing that I, I always appreciated of Sid Mead, and I have a friend, uh, Tim Lawrence. I don't know if you heard of him. He was my, no. in my class. He was a very good friend of, of, of him. One thing that uh, he also say, says is that uh, Sid Mead was very humble. This means that he said, you know, sometimes I screw up too. Because there is, it's always a learning experience. Especially when you want to try to do things different. When you are in a transition period where you, of your life or artistic life or professional life where you feel the need to go over, you know, to change, to change cap or to explore new things. And so I guess that, of course, he's human. He was human like us. He also would, would, uh, would make a few things that probably didn't like. That for us, even if they were wrong, they would be perfect. You know, give it to me, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, you know. But at the same time, I think that uh, to be demanding with yourself, with what you do, and that's what I learned at Art Center, it comes also from that type of uh, attitude, you know, mental attitude. And this is typical I have to say, because I know other design schools, I think that is very typical of Art Center. And some people say, yeah, you guys, you look like a set, you know, like a religious set. <laughs> you are up here in the hill in Lida Street in Pasadena. <laughs> Nobody knows what you do. No, it's not that. It's simply a professional environment that is forcing young people to be professional right away. Because tomorrow I take you, I put you into the fire, and you're going to do anything you can not to get burned. So, so Luciano, when you when you eventually when you eventually found yourself there, what, how did you um, uh, adjust into this new environment where people were just, um, as you said, like exceptional at what they did? Yeah, it was it was difficult for me because uh, you have to know that in America, also like in Russia, for example, in some East countries, you know, in other countries, there are. Um, the basics of drawing or illustrations or arts classes are done in a way that is a very classical studies. So like we used to do in Italy, in France, in Spain, when uh, at, the, at the time of my father, my mother, or my grandfather, my grandmother, you know, very strict, you know, the chiaroscuro, the perspective, the figure drawing. Then we lost this in, in, the, in the last... Uh, three, four years. So when I did art class, it was like, okay, you, you look, looks like you have a good talent. Keep, keep sketching, you know, but we never had really teachers that would show us some techniques with passion and with, you know, with discipline. So I was sketching simply because I guess I have a sort of a artistic talent, but I didn't know that I was, that I could do much more. So when I went to Art Center, I discovered that I was in a class with American uh, students, uh, Korean, uh, Japanese students, that at the beginning they were much better than me. So I said, what the hell do I do here? I mean, I'm never going to reach their, their level. So I was very worried. And this took almost a year. And then because the school and you, because you have the passion, because you want to make it, it becomes a lot, I always talk about uh, uh, a beautiful military service, you know. In general, military service is a little bit uh, a pain, you know. But there it was a nice pain because you are always constantly challenging yourself. The system is pushes you to do that. The teachers force you to do that. The, the, the competition in your student's environment, your peer, is forcing you to do that because you 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 stay behind, and in such a school with the the money spent because it's a real investment, and for that I will always thank my mother and my father, you know, for everything they did for me, not only the the sacrifice which is emotional, you know, to have me five years away, but also economical. Believe me, not like going into a school in Europe. Yeah. So what happens is that you tell yourself. I cannot fail. I have to do something to move on and to improve. 
So little by little, after a year, I discovered that I was not that far anymore. And uh, at the sixth term with the Nissan project, I made the cap. And I was like, I would say, in the average of the class. And, uh, and you can see also by your classmates that they start looking at your stuff, that they ask you how you did that, you know. So then when that happens, you feel, well, you know, it looks like I'm doing something that looks good at least, you know, and the teachers also. But at the beginning, my, my, one of my best teachers, Harry Bradley, that I hope is going to watch this video. Now he's probably retired. Harry Bradley was fantastic designer. Draw. He would draw the car upside down. You are in front. He take a pencil, black pencil, like, uh, like this one, you know, on a white paper, and he will start sketching the wheels, but upside down. Jesus. So that you see, and he's just doing the reflection and everything. And I would say, how the hell he does that? But w w tell me about that first year. What exactly are you, what, what, you, so you have this realization uh, that if I need to get better, it's a big investment, I'm not good enough. What are you doing? On What are you doing with your time? To you elevate work. your skills, what are you, you doing? Work. You sketch, you sketch, you sketch. I, sometimes I sketch with my one of my classmates that was better than me. Some other times with another friend that was doing product design and he knew how to work uh, with markers very well. So I tried to learn from them. But the most important thing was when uh, Harry Bradley, Andy Ogden, uh, Ted Yankin, great teacher, Ted Yankin, great teacher, product design. And he, he, they were making the demos, the tutorials. And for us, we didn't have videos, we could not record like we do today. So for me, it was like uh, an incredible present, you know, to see them fly with their pencils over the paper. Wow. Same thing I say today. Come on, move your arm. Don't move your verse. Your pivot point is here. Make that break dance with your arm and just fly over the paper and try to sketch nicely your car. Because that's the hard thing, you know, the quality of the lines, the line quality, the line weight. All things that for me were very abstract at the beginning. I didn't understand. Then you realize a line that is just a simple line it's bidimensional. But when you apply line weight and line quality, it becomes three-dimensional, even if it's just a line. And you see it in three D in three dimensions. Wow. I heard that they used to do I'm um, I think this was after your time, but I wonder if it if it was still when you were there. Where they there was like this these exercises that you were required to do, like drawing like fifty lines straight. Yeah, I, and I do it with my with my students. Yeah? Is yeah, that something that they did when you were there as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did many pages. Today they do a couple of pages and they say, and you see that okay, it's not that bad. But for us it was different. That was the beginning. If, today it's called more warm up exercise. And not every school is doing it to draw circles and yeah. then draw big circles, small until small circles, ellipses in different orientations. And everything is the way you move your arm. You have to have a control. I always say that uh, to draw, it's a question of heart. You know, I did a TED, a TED uh, talk, I had this chance, and I said it's, a, it's an affair of love. It's a, it's an act of love to become to be a designer, you know, whether it's car design, graphic design, or whatever other design uh, type. It's an act of love because to design, to sketch, is love. It's a very romantic part of ourselves. It's artistic, very artistic. But you have to combine the the right brain and the left brain. It comes from your heart. It goes to your brain. It comes out from your arm, and you have to master that so that you get the right balance between the three actions and then uh, your hands really flies on paper and you can make a very fine line that is simply well done. And when you don't have that balance, the lines are 
like carving the paper, destroying the little hair that every paper has. You know, we never use uh, uh, erasers. When I see the people say, okay, I understood, I, I changed it. And they start erasing, what, what are you using? An eraser, sir. Throw that eraser right away from the window. We don't use erasers. That's why you sketch light. Because when you draw on top of your light lines, you will pick up the right lines to which you give line weight and line quality. You get your silhouette, you give a little bit of shading, and the light lines, the wrong ones, your eyes will not see them anymore. So when I make a demo, a tutorial, you know, I, my sketch, even with colors, it's the, it's from the beginning until the end. I never retrace or, you know, or erase a line. I just leave it there. At the end, uh, with the background, with other colors and stuff, and the focal point, all the little tricks, you don't see the, the original lines. You see only the one I picked up. Did you want to tell me about um, this? This this uh, uh, co was it a competition that you that you won at at Art Center or was it a an internship? Okay, I, I had both. I, the Nissan project, the Nissan Maxis, but two thousand uh, was a project given by Nissan uh, in California in nineteen eighty six. I believe, yeah, eighty six. And uh, I was three. <laughs> I was not, <laughs> and we made uh, we made this uh, this interior half scale, so it was like a bathtub, okay. And uh, we designed the interior. We did also some sketch of the exterior, but the project was focused on the interior. And our team we were five people. We won the first prize, so we were first. We were in the gallery for three months for a semester. We're all proud. We're very happy nice drawings uh, and nice model and uh, at that time we put um, we did not have lead but we used uh, the fluorescent uh, tubular lights hidden inside the clay model with the color film to get from the door panels a sort of a light a violet you know light oh, wow. on the, of this and uh, and uh, and we put displays with a uh, plexiglass, uh, dark plexiglass, with a little bit of form. And the Japanese, uh, I don't remember his name, but the Japanese designer that made the, the, the driver's seat, included in the driver's seat uh, an element that was also the driving position with, uh, with a screen in front. And that was an incredible thing because everybody were, was doing a dashboard with, a, you know, detached with the seat. And we made the seat and the element all together moving, you know? Wow. So anyway, we won that, that and it was very nice. And uh, that was the, 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 the sponsor project we, as a contest. But uh, internship, I had an internship also the year after for four months. And I was I went into a motorhome, big huge company, American company in Riverside, uh, in the desert almost of California. And I would drive from Pasadena two hours and a half in the morning to be there, there at eight thirty, and five p.m. leave and get all the traffic jam going to Los Angeles. So it was very tiring, but it was very exciting, very exciting. Wow. And I didn't make a few designs of the day they made after. So at what point do you start working for, for, for Fiat then? In 1989, I graduated in August, 1989. And uh, I received a telegram. A telegram. Yeah. <laughs> and Ron Hill, the, the ex-chair of Transportation Design Department, who was the, the, the father of the Renault Fuego? No, the, uh, scusa, the, the, um, the Pontiac Fiero. Okay. Uh, he uh, asked me, he told me I got this from uh, Chris Bengo in Fiat. He would like to, to see you in Torino. So after graduation, the 5th of September, I, I, I quit California. I go back to Italy, and in November, no, in October, 
I go to Torino and I made the whole, you know, all the studios. And, and I made my, my interview with Chris Bengal and Hermano Cresson, who was the father of the Alpha 75, the Alpha Giulietta before the 75. Wow. You know, he was the one that created the cuneo shape of uh, those Alpha of the uh, mid 80s, you know, very aggressive, very nice. But how did, how did this come about? How did they find out about you? Because uh, Lino Manocchia, the Italian journalist, came back to after five years or three years, I remember. He came back to Art Center and they told him, you know, that we have an Italian. Because I was one of the first Italians to be there. And he said, yeah, fantastic. So we're going to speak Italian. I'm going to make a very nice article for him with, uh, ah. with the Italian TV. The second channel. Oh, and Chris wow. saw me in, uh, in the second channel, Rai, Rai 2, you know. So what, you uh, were on TV? Yeah. Fuck, and my that's so saw cool. Me. So you can imagine, everybody, wow, Luciano is making it. It's very fantastic. It's nice. With my models, you know, explaining how it worked at the art center, explaining the cost, how was the living, how were the difficulties. And then you receive the telegram and Chris says he wants to interview you in Torino. Me, yeah. Wow. And what was that like? What was that interview like? Yeah, I, the me, at the beginning, I didn't know about Chris Bango, to be honest. I, Ron Hill just told me, you know, he was a student from us, a little crazy guy, but he's a very good, you're going to see he's very dynamic. But I was, uh, in my mentality, I was thinking of somebody that is a director, so somebody that is up there, you know, I'm down here. So I was a little bit intimidated. When I went there, I saw a guy that looked like came in from Texas. Hey man, how you doing? So how was it? So I said, when I saw that, I said, but this guy, is he Chris Bengo? <laughs> and then Hermano Cresson, he said, don't worry, in Italian, I said, don't worry, he's like that. Relax. <laughs> Oh, cool. So he, and he was, and, and, and what was it like working for him as a, what was he like as a boss? Yeah. Okay. So this is a, thank you for the question because uh, I own Chris, you know, who, who is a good friend, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, esteem, uh, you know, between us, but also affection because we are still in, in contact. We, we met several times and uh, simply to, 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 to meet you know, for, for other reasons. And um, Chris is the one that uh, translated with his behavior the design management according to what I learned from my father. You know, my father was the institutional way of doing things. Right. Being uh, very strong, you know, like uh, I would say my father would be more like Draghi, our new president of... Uh, of a conseil that is somebody very strict, smiling, but he knows where he goes and, and very professional, very establishment, you know, a little bit more like that. Chris was the same thing, but crazy. Like, don't worry, don't worry, just take it easy. You want to kill somebody, let's go and kill somebody. But you better justify this killing unless I'll kill you. Wow. So I saw Chris in the meetings when I was accompanying him a few times on a few projects, getting pissed at the engineers. I told you, we want to do this. Uh, no, then we can change. Give me the technical drawing. Look, I changed the section. Can we do this? Can we? So challenging, you know? And when I saw that, I said, yeah, the design has to win. <laughs> we had to win because Fiat was doing always those uh, boxes, you know? And that's how he got the, the coupe, the barchetta, the, the new uh, tempra, the new, the new tipo, stuff like that, you know, all those cars that uh, really changed the uh, Fiat uh, uh, lineup uh, for, for about uh, 10 years. You know, it's interesting you say that because I think, like, Anders, say, Anders Warming said exactly the same thing. And he said that, uh, Chris said to him, like, I'm a cannon. He's like, I, you, I, will, um, I will blow a hole in the wall for you. You just need to 
point me in the right direction. Yes. And I heard a lot of different things about Chris over the years, and it's um, and uh, but I think the th- the common thread that I've heard about him with regard to his team is that he always protected his team. Yes, it's true. He it's always true. protected his team, and he would go and fight anybody to protect you know this this vision and and the people that that make up that vision and um yes, and one thing of him that i appreciate also and that also patrick lekeman has and also lawrence uh, and now gilles, <laughs> gilles Vidal, is that those are people that have a vision but their vision is not simply because they say i have to find something different so that i remark myself from the others no it's a vision that is justified by their f- personal philosophy or approach to car design and design environment. Which is a little bit like Sid Mead. No, Sid Mead is the, it's extreme in, in, my, in my opinion, you know, because he, he provokes. It's, in, here we are more down to earth. But the, 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 the objective is the same. And it's justified because those are men of cultures. You know? They are cultivated. They read. Uh, Chris, for example, sometimes when he talks to you, he says, because then I read a book of a philosopher that he thinks that if you do this, then this is the result. And I, I thought that this you can apply to car design. When he says that, you start thinking, oh, wait, wait a moment, I'm, I already got lost. Where are you? He explains again, and then it makes sense. So he, he thinks fast. No, he's, he's, uh, he's, fast he's, yeah. he's definitely operating on, a, on, a, on another level, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, yeah. you hear it when he's speaking, and uh, he's not... I mean, there's people that speak fast and talk shit, but, you know, he's... he's he speaks with a level of intellect and at such a rate that I can't, I, it's, it's very impressive. It's very impressive. Yeah, so for me, he taught me a lot during my, the beginning of my career as a manager, how you do things, you know, how you cannot get some objectives and some uh, uh, achieve, you know, what you think it's right to achieve. And most of all, he taught me that we managers are there, first of all, to defend design, not to make just compromises. First is to defend design because the engineering environment has a tendency for culture, for the way they study, the way the experience they have, the way their um, hierarchy is made in big companies like Fiat or like Renault or like, uh, I don't know, the American company, you know, it's, it's huge. They, are, they have a tendency to say, we, we have the solution, we stick to the solution. And no, because design sometimes, it needs you to make an extra step to change the technical solution to adapt it better and make sure that I don't change my design. And therefore, we as designer, we don't have to go there and just pretend to change something because my styling is good or cool. That's stupid. That's stylish, but we don't care about that. Design is to make a project. It comes from Latin. So design means that I get into the technical detail and I help you. I have a creativity. Engineers have creativity. I think that sometimes they just breed it, you know, they just stop it, you know, or kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, restrain it, you know. And then let's be creative. You know? I ask you questions, can we do this? Tell me yes or no. Even if it's an extra cost, who cares? You won't decide, I won't decide, but we bring a solution. And then if it's a cost of 100, we already start from something that we can do. Then we will discover together how we can bring that cost lower. And then maybe it's the material, change a fixing point, uh, change slightly a cut line, tooling size, all that stuff. So having had that example, 
And being me in nature, somebody that is 50% creative, 50% interested in all that you know, complicated technical world, because I'm not an engineer, it made me learn a lot of things. Because I always ask, still today, can you explain to me? Ah, but this is not the meeting to explain uh, things. I said, no, you have to explain to me. If you want me to help you, then you are in a situation where you learn, and once you understand, you can counter answer with a solution or sort of a solution to always find a way to protect your design and make sure that the briefing and, and the hard points are solved in a responsible way. That's the game. It doesn't happen all the time, but the main, the main uh, strategy as a design project manager is this one. I defend what designers do. How would you compare engineers of 20 years ago compared to now? There's no, mu there's no much difference. It's a culture. Still today, young engineers that are 35 years old, when they come, they talk to us or to me, they say, ah, we have uh, the stylist of Renault. I say, I'm a designer, I'm not a stylist. I don't, I'm not Armani or, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Paul Gutierrez, I, just, I don't know. I'm a designer, I do projects. I, I have to deal with the planning, money, technology, materials, thickness, sections. So they, it's, it's a question, I think, uh, I made a video, styling versus design, you know? And this video is on my YouTube channel. It, 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 once in a while, it still gets clicked. It's an old video. But basically, I try to explain the difference of being a stylist and being a designer. If somebody says that, hey, Lushan, you're a very good stylist, I get offended. To be a stylist, it's enough to go to any art school. Don't go to spend a lot of money in art center and, and uh, have all the difficulties that I had to go through. Being a designer is another, another game. It's a responsibility. It's a, it, you become a, a man of enterprise and not just you as a designer. You, you, you become a sort of a lawyer of your designers, not mine, because I don't have a hierarchic power, but I work for them in the team. We have a, a design director, in my case, it's Louis Moras, okay? And then Gilles Vidal, and then, of course, Lawrence. But the objective is to make sure I can guide you to make sure that what you will do, it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's going to be possible to make. And that comes from the experience, the strategy, what you think, because you have been designer. So you know when you see a briefing and you make the first meetings, you know, with all technical people, uh, who wants what, or who is trying to protect uh, uh, in terms of uh, not spending money, because that's always the classical mantra, you know. And then you realize what you have to bargain. The strategy, I give you this, what do you give to me? So maybe sometimes, uh, I hope that my, <laughs> that my colleagues don't see this video. Sometimes I say, I don't know, we want the thing that has to be like that because for us it's very important. It's really part of the design, the design core. Then they come back and they say, yeah, but if you don't move it of three centimeter, we cannot, we can never make it. And I know that they are right. And I don't say anything during the meeting. And then I do like uh, Lieutenant Colombo. I don't know if you saw the, the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Pasadena. <laughs> grande Colombo, grande. And I say, ah, by the way, at the end, uh, I, have a, I have a good news for you. I forgot to tell you before. What? I think we can move that thing up three centimeters. It's going to be okay. I'm going to check before confirming, but I think, I think because they already accepted that thing. Therefore, now I can manage how to modify it. So where do you, where, where do you learn that from, Luciano? That's, I think that that's from my father. Yeah? Yeah, this is from my father. I want to ask you something else about your communication. You're a very passionate guy. You're very, and, uh, and, and very flamboyant and, uh, 
and um, I've got a lot of energy. Um, but you also have a way of bringing things to a point as well. If Where did you learn to communicate like you do? I have to tell you that when I was um, a young boy, I was very shy, very timid. Also with girls, to be honest. Yeah? So I, I don't believe you. Old, 18 years old. Do I talk? Do I say no? <laughs> I was always with my heart. And then we had, in, uh, in Italy, we had, uh, in South Italy, in 1980, a big earthquake. I don't know, probably you don't know because you were not born yet. No. But uh, there was a big earthquake. There were a lot of dead people, uh, destroyed houses. And our house got some damage, our apartment. So we went to live in another place, in a small village on the sea, on the Amalfitan coast, because we had an apartment there. So he said, okay, we're going to stay there six months, the time to fix, you know. So we changed school. And I went to a school, um, high school, and I didn't know that I was, we were three guys and all girls. Wow. When I got in the, in the, in the, the hi, we have a new student. You know, I was 17 years old. When I saw old girl, I said, oh my God, how can I do? They're going to kill me. So I go, I sit down in the back, all three guys. And then that, there started my, my new life as being less timid, less shy. Because life, the changes... The, the shock also of the earthquake, which was very, very dramatic. Uh, it provoked all sorts of change made in my mind that it's like you get older faster. You know? Yeah. Even if nothing dramatic happened to me or my family or my, my parents or relatives, but still it was a very strong experience. And then the girls were really, very nice. So at the end of... Uh, that helped me a lot to express myself. So everything was inside start coming coming out. And the American experience helped me a lot because America, in my opinion, when I start speaking English, I start realizing that here with English language, and I think also England is the same thing, or all Anglo-Saxon countries, you can I can be more, I can feel more myself to be myself. In France, it's a little bit uh, funny. Because if you yell, are you mad? No. <laughs> but you're yelling. Yeah, but I'm not mad. <laughs> so it's it's a cultural <laughs> thing, you know. In Italy, you yell, are you happy? Well, what's wrong? <laughs> you know? Or maybe you're mad. <laughs> In America, uh, they also talk with the hands, uh, because I see the Americans also in TV. <laughs> But it's more like, uh, hey, come on, you know, it's more easy going. And this helps a lot to, ex to give you the opportunity psychologically to free of the little, you know, breaks, psychological breaks of expression and stuff and express yourself. And then car design, it's a field where you have to communicate. Therefore, there is a moment where you have to break the last little things that are forcing you not to talk, to talk, because you have to present. And you have to learn how to use your words, how long you're going to be presenting, to stay calm if the big boss comes and say, this is bullshit, and not react, you know. So there are a lot of things that uh, this job gave me, uh, how can I say, gave me the opportunity to understand uh, how, which are the limits of my a, a extravaganza, let's say, or my way of being, but at the same time to learn how to control myself. At the beginning, I was much more. Today, I would say, as some of my colleagues say, say you are a very wise person <laughs> because you because you didn't see me when I was thirty years old. <laughs> but uh, it's true. With the experience, then you learn how to put all together, and then you become more constructive for the team, which is uh, my first priority how can we how can i be useful to them and therefore to the company